outside of this conference. So I wanted to give some background to the humanitarian sector uh, to, to put this work in context, and then a little bit later, we'll get more into OpenStreetMap. So what is the humanitarian sector? There's different populations that humanitarians work uh, for or with, I would say, um, to, to benefit, I guess is the way to say it. Uh, one way to look at it is people who are forcibly displaced worldwide, and that has been going up a lot. You can see, I had a mic to just turn up, <laughs> um, an increase starting around actually 2020. There was kind of a, a steady uh, count, and this is people who are in in displaced internally in their own countries um, called um, IDPs, internally displaced people, and then if you're forcibly um, displaced out of your country, you become a refugee. So this is both, um, and it's gone up a lot due to conflict um, and also uh, drought and like uh, environmental factors. So there's a lot going on behind this. Um, humanitarians do also uh, work for um, work to benefit uh, people who are also still in their homes, who have lost access to basic services such as water, food, security. Humanitarian work is basically keeping people alive. It's like the basic needs. So um, this kind of breaks down that graph a little bit to see what major events have uh, created humanitarian contexts where people did have um, healthy, vibrant lives, something happens, um, climate, politics, uh, conflict all comes together. Um, so you can see in the last few years, uh, like there, there's been you know, in the last 20, 30 years, there's been a lot of events, but things um, such as the war in Ukraine, um, the Arab Spring has really increased a lot. Um, there hasn't been a lot of numbers published yet in the last couple of years, um, so this doesn't include uh, the last year of mostly internal displacement that's been driving up. Where are people in need of humanitarian service? You guys can come in from the, <laughs> I think there's room if you come over here. Um, so, uh, the UN has a definition of what people in need means, and they do surveys, they collect data, um, mostly on the ground talking to uh, people they want to help, um, also looking at other factors, and they estimate the people in need um, by country. So you can see a lot of it is across um, Africa, some of Southeast Asia, up into Europe a little bit, and some somewhat of um, the Central Americas. Um, this chart is actually a a screenshot of an interactive dashboard, so it looks a little bit funky. Um, the percentage is the funds that are pledged to help uh, to, to meet the estimated needs of humanitarian work. Um, and as you can see, these numbers are quite high. Um, the DRC, um, the Congo, is the one that's only 37%, 30, almost 40% matched. So. I show this slide to show that there's a heavy need for better data in the humanitarian sector. There's less resources and growing need. And the way to more effectively meet those needs is through better data. Um, why are people displaced? I, I talked a little bit about this, but this is a mapping conference, so I wanted to show a map. Um, the, the blue is people mostly in need. Um, oh, no, this is internally displaced. So they're, uh, they're in need because they have been moved out of their homes. They're still in their countries. The blue is natural disasters. Um, you can see that there is a big blue dot in America. So there's quite a few people who um, have had to move because of storms, tornadoes, things like that here in our country. Uh, and orange is war. Um, so there is an interesting spatial pattern. You can see Southeast Asia uh, has a, except for um, uh, one exception of Myanmar, um, has a lot of storms. And that's only going to increase with climate change. So. Another complicated slide that I just kind of throw up to show, you know, these are these are huge numbers, right? Like, how how are we actually, as a sector, trying to address those humanitarian needs? There's a lot that goes into humanitarian work. Um, there's there's planning. There's also logistics. There's advocacy. And how this is kind of broken down is the cluster system. Um, and as you can see, the cluster system moves quite slowly. Back in 1991, they decided we should start organizing. Uh, and this is. UN and um, non-governmental organizations or NGOs um, that have come together to kind of work on similar stuff together didn't actually really get um, implemented into 2005. But um, so it's slow. But again, I show this to show to to kind of um, demonstrate why we need data. Uh, there's these big movements, 
you, you need some things to bring people together. Um, and I really think GIS and mapping can do that. So we'll get a little bit into that. Um, there's certain groups and frameworks who really focus on data. There's the UN Sustainable Development Goals, but there's also the Sunday framework and Sphere. Um, lots of data frameworks that say, like, every person in the world should be this far from water, right? Um, so you can actually calculate that spatially. Um, or um, think looking at things like human density and uh, waste tr water treatment. Um, there's, there's standards that they're somewhat context specific, but at least it's a, it's a goal to get to, so you can kind of, you can use data to see how far you need to go and come. It's okay, now we'll get into OpenStreetMap. So um, if you're not familiar with HOT, Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team, we are not OpenStreetMap. We just really like OpenStreetMap. Uh, we use it a lot, but we also do a lot of other open mapping uh, with aerial imagery and, and data. Uh, to work with local communities to collect and use data to inform humanitarian and development action. Uh, we're a global company, um, completely remote. Uh, in 2020, uh, HOT grew to actually have a uh, permanent presence in four regional hub countries, hub <laughs> that has these countries assigned to it, get that wrong. Um, and then we also have a central support team, which I sit on. So that's kind of just where we generally work. Um, the way we approach data is through these four data principles. So open and accessible, I think is something that everyone in this room really identifies with. Uh, also useful and usable data. Um, the world is big, we really need to focus our efforts and things can get tricky if you're not creating data that's usable. Um, so that's a really important one. Inclusive and representative, I think that's another one this audience can really identify with that we want to make sure the communities at all levels are able to access and contribute to OpenStreetMap to show the reality of their communities and ethical data and protection. Um, I won't get that into that too much today, but that's making sure that we are considering the um, political context and the sensitivities everywhere we work, which is in a lot of humanitarian context. So a little bit of background of the growth of using OpenStreetMap for humanitarian uh, purposes. This, this is uh, a big chart made by our colleagues at Heidelberg University in Germany and a couple of their partners looking at the growth of OpenStreetMap and how it relates to the sector. It's a little hard for me to see on this angle, so I have to look down. Um, at the top, you can see those frameworks that I mentioned earlier, the Sendai, um, which is like disaster management, sustainable development goals in the Paris Agreement, the big climate one. You can see those actually align with a lot of work and growth from HOT and other institutions that contributed to the growth of humanitarian mapping. So you can see the tools uh, that were developed. We have a tasking manager, which coordinates con contributions to OpenStreetMap, uh, and that has expanded to other tools that I think you'll recognize, such as MapSwipe um, and other access tools that we'll kind of get into a little bit later that have contributed to a growth uh, in, in OpenStreetMap. And then there's also uh, major activations. This does only go to 2020, but you can kind of see that things have been picking up, a lot's coming together. So, um, I mean, everyone in this room has probably contributed to OpenStreetMap, I hope. <laughs> um, so, we, the, the, the opportunity for HOT, um, working for the humanitarian context, <coughs> is that, <coughs> sorry, that uh, even though, um, Regions with low and medium human development only account for 28% of buildings and 60% of roads mapped in OpenStreetMap. They are home to 46% of the global population. So there's been a lot more growth um, in wealthier countries in OpenStreetMap than non-wealthier countries. And that's where humanitarian mapping has come in. Uh, so you can see on that top map that uh, buildings that are tagged from humanitarian um, OpenStreetMap team, they're mostly in those contexts that we looked at earlier, um, Central America's, Africa's, Africa, Southeast Asia, um, and that bottom map is just kind of show the disparity, um, disparity in the world. Uh, and we do work with local communities where we can, um, especially on the ground with like field mapping. So it's not, it, it, it's a global effort. Um, and I think it's working. You can see here that um, starting in 2009, OpenStreetMap edits, this is uh, first activities, really started like US, Europe, um, but as time went on, it's really expanded globally. And you can see edits um, 
uh, expanding in like South America and Africa and Southeast Asia. So that's really cool that that data that uh, didn't initially start being created before um, is available now. So where are humanitarians accessing OpenStreetMap? A lot of humanitarians um, aren't familiar with OpenStreetMap. They are just scrambling to find data uh, when they're working on a crisis to, to make a map um, to inform the response. So there's two main ways that uh, people who are doing GIS are downloading OpenStreetMap data that uh, HOT uh, um, supports. One is our export tool where you can export directly from OpenStreetMap. Um, we created that in 2015. Uh, there's also something called the Humanitarian Data Exchange, which is run by the UN that has more than just HOTS open data or OpenStreetMap through HOTS. <laughs> um, it's, it's really large, so a lot of people know about HGX and uh, that is what we're gonna do a little bit of a deep dive into today. Yes. Okay, so this, uh, is, this just shows that there's been a pretty big increase um, in downloads uh, since 2017 and the different tools that we have created. So as expected, it's gone up as more people know about it and uh, OpenStreetMap data availability becomes more available. Uh, so trends, and that was actually both export tool and HGX. This is just HGX. Uh, again, the trends have really grown a lot, which is amazing. It really shows that people are really seeing the value in OpenStreetMap um, and wanting to use it for humanitarian purposes. If you look at just the top 10 countries, um, which are listed here, um, that is the that part they account for. So, and these are, they are pretty representative of some of the top humanitarian contexts um, of the last uh, three years, 2019 to 2020. Um, so if you're wondering like what humanitarian events uh, align with downloads, that is what we're gonna look at next. So if we zoom in to the top of this chart, here we go. Um, these are the top four events where there was a huge event that people were turning to OpenStreetMap to inform the event. So um, in Indonesia, um, a big volcanic eruption, the Ukraine invasion, that one we actually weren't creating new data, but people were still looking at OpenStreetMap to try and figure out uh, where, like a lot of the immediate response is humanitarian access planning, what roads you can take, where the population is, Turkey, Syria, earthquake, um, and most recently the Kenya floods tied to, um, I think, El Nino. So you can see, especially the Turkey, Syria, earthquake in Ukraine, there's, there's a lot of downloads uh, coming from the humanitarian world to OpenStreetMap to inform the response. Um, a little bit of a bigger picture by region. Uh, you can see again that it's uh, mostly Africa and Southeast Asia. So this is kind of representative of humanitarian context and where the people in need are, which is, is something you would expect to see, right? Um, which is pretty interesting that, that that spatial pattern aligns, that the biggest crises people are downloading the most uh, for humanitarian purposes. What are people turning to OpenStreetMap for? Roads is by far the biggest thing. And then waterways and building footprints and populated places um, also come in there. Those are data sets that OpenStreetMap is really good at globally. Uh, they're straightforward. Um, they don't change constantly. And, and a lot of humanitarians are looking to that one source um, so they don't have to figure out a new source every time. So those are the top data sets uh, that people use. I know I'm running out of time, so I won't get super into these, but mostly people are using these to, uh, like I was saying before, logistic planning. So finding um, where the population is through building footprints, but also populated place names, like settlements, and then that road access. Those are kind of like that key, that first part of looking at things. Um, things like vaccine planning, uh, aid delivery, that, that's really important. Uh, that, that is a really big use of OpenStreetMap. Um, when there's no other data, this is really, really critical for humanitarians supporting. A lot of times governments are overwhelmed from political reasons or just they're also experiencing the crisis that's hitting. Um, so data sharing in the early days of response can be really tricky. So OpenStreetMap really has become the go-to uh, access point for, for geographic data. So there's still a lot of work to do. Um, as you saw that there's tons of access and downloads to OpenStreetMap um, for humanitarian purposes, but there's still a lot of gaps. So I hope everyone in this room, if you haven't already, will check out HOT's Tasking Manager. These are just examples of figuring out where uh, people who are displaced in Somalia are and looking at Sudan 
uh, and where there's roads gaps. Um, that white part is all where there's no population. So there's still a lot of uh, mapping to be done. So I hope you check out Hot's Tasking Mas Ma Manager. If you go to hotosm.org and click start, get started or start mapping, um, you all will be able to pick it up really fast. So I don't know if I have time for questions, but I'll stick around after.